Are you passionate about foreign policy, national security, and the latest in domestic politics? Consider becoming a member of the DSR Network, your go-to source for in-depth analysis and insightful discussions. With the DSR Network podcasts, stay ahead of the curve on global affairs. Each episode features top experts, policymakers, and thought leaders who break down complex issues into digestible, engaging conversations. From breaking news to historical context, we cover the topics that matter most. Whether it's the intricacies of international diplomacy, the latest in national security strategies, or the dynamics of U.S. politics, the DSR Network has you covered. Members receive an ad-free listening experience, bonus content for virtually all of our shows, an invitation to join the DSR Slack community, enhanced show notes for select podcasts, and much more. Visit the dsrnetwork.com slash buy and enter code graduate to receive 30% off the regular membership price for the first year or first month. That's the dsrnetwork.com slash buy and code graduate. Thank you very much for your support. This is the Daily Blast from the New Republic, produced and presented by the DSR Network. I'm your host, Greg Sargent. Any day now, the Supreme Court is expected to rule on Donald Trump's demand for immunity from prosecution for alleged crimes related to his effort to overturn his 2020 loss. Depending on how the court rules, it's still possible Trump's trial will begin before the election. But what if the damage is already done? Veteran labor strategist Michael Podhorzer, a very sharp observer of our politics, has a new piece on his substack arguing that in fact the court has already interfered in the election by delaying the trial to the degree it has. If this is right, the crisis we may be heading for, or maybe are already living through right now, is not widely appreciated enough. So we invited Michael on the show to talk about it. Welcome. Hi, it's great to be here. Regular listener. Thank you, Michael. So special counsel Jack Smith wanted an expedited ruling on the immunity claim, but the court dragged its feet. We could have had a verdict before the election. Now, no matter what happens, we will almost certainly not have one. Can you take us through your argument on all this? Sure. Uh, So in December of last year, Jack Smith anticipating that the question of presidential immunity would be significant, asked the Supreme Court to rule on it so the case can move ahead. The Supreme Court, really, the um, you know, the Republican appointees, um, declined to hear it then. Um, and so it proceeded in the way it should have and was appealed to the district court, which um, in a bipartisan fashion, unanimously and resoundingly turned down that appeal. Your listeners probably remember that was when the whole idea of SEAL Team 6 assassinating political opponents came up, right? At that point, the trial was set to begin on March 4th and would have taken at most a couple of months, which means that but for the Supreme Court belatedly deciding to put a stay on the case so they could hear this, the verdict on Trump's role on January 6th would be in the rearview mirror, right? That this would have been done. The only reason it hasn't been done is because the same Republican justices who said, we're not going to hear it in December when it would have been timely, decided to wait till the last minute to say you can't do the trial because we have to decide this and are now delaying well past um, what would be ordinarily the length of time to come down with a decision to put it off as long as possible. Well, Michael, one can envision scenarios in which the trial starts before the election. For instance, if the court says something like core official acts of the presidency have immunity from prosecution but the acts at the core of the charges against Trump do not. I mean, we're talking here about corruptly pressuring his vice president to subvert the electoral count, the effort to recruit fake electors, and so forth. 
possible the court says those aren't official acts. But, and this is where I think your point is important, even if that happens and the trial starts this fall, it's still highly plausible we don't get a verdict before the election, right? And and the alternative, if the court had not dragged its feet, would have meant we definitely got one. So even in the best case scenario, it's not good enough, right? Right. Not only is it not good enough, but remember too, this also helps the Republican Party more broadly because if there had been a verdict by now, then when they nominate Trump, they would be nominated a convicted felon of January 6th and have the greater own what happened, right? And they've been led off far too easily for all their complicity in this. But at that point, it would be clear. But the thing I want to say, though, because I think a lot of people are sort of op- thinking that there's an optimistic way that there could still be a trial. And I think that's still not absorbing the crisis that the court has created here. Because what it would mean is that it would be a historic showdown between the, or- the ordinary criminal justice process, which would have the trial and pretrial process start as soon as the case came down, and the orderly running of federal presidential elections in which there would be no legal constraint on what a party's nominated candidate would be. They've created a no-win situation. If I understand you correctly, you're saying that uh, that itself, that conflict between an ongoing trial this fall, if it happens, and the and the climax of the election is itself the stuff of crisis and didn't have to happen. Right. And if you remember back when many of us, I know you are, all really wanting to see Trump held accountable, especially after the January 6 hearings and so on, at that point, he was just citizen Trump, right? Yeah. And, and even then, there were folks who were kind of saying, well, it looks unseemly if the Justice Department is going after a former president, right? By delaying this so that there's going to be this conflict between what's right in terms of the criminal justice system and what's right in terms of how we pick presidents puts us on our back feet for demanding what should have been done before when it wouldn't have been controversial, right? But now it's lose-lose, right? Either we get the trial you're talking about, and that itself becomes part of the fall campaign. It then becomes a big part of what MAGA says is the reason Trump lost. It wasn't a free and fair election, right? There's all that baggage that they're ensuring if the trial goes ahead. And if it doesn't, then we've seen in focus groups and in other kinds of settings that a lot of the kind of uh, people who voted for Biden in 2020 are actually pretty disillusioned that after making this a central issue, we're four years later and there's been no accountability. We saw historic levels of turnout in 2018 and 2020, right? Um, right. The the country really mobilized because it understood that this guy is a threat to the system itself. That happened twice. And, and in 2022, it kind of happened. It, 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 it's a bit of a split decision, maybe, but Democrats vastly overperformed precisely because of the Trump threat and the MAGA threat and so forth. But what we've seen since is that the opportunities for accountability are just getting frittered away. They're just getting pissed away one by one. I mean, I, I, I tend to maybe look a little bit optimistically on what happened in the Manhattan Hush Money trial. I, I think that's a big deal. Oh, I think that was hugely important. I think, yeah, for sure. Right. But broadly speaking, it, it it's a real problem for faith in the system that the opportunities for accountability have just been pissed away. Right. Well, I would say they've been pissed away. I'd say been taken away by the judges he appointed. <laughs> that's another right? way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the other part of what I was writing today is that if we saw what's happening here in any other country where a president loses an election, tries to overthrow it, um, the results, including a deadly assault on the Capitol. We actually saw that in Brazil with Bolsonaro. And then the legal system tries to hold him accountable. Again, we saw it with Bolsonaro and everyone was saying, thank God there's a rule of law in Brazil. 
here, people are saying, oh my God, we're going to destroy the credibility of the legal system if we prosecute him. And instead, we have him not being prosecuted because of the three judges he appointed, plus Alito and Thomas. Any other country, we'd see that as a, one of the basic pages of the authoritarian playbook. That's what Orban did, right? He appointed judges, lost an election, came back in. I mean, that's what they do. And But for whatever reason, people have been reluctant to call out that obvious fact. Let's talk about this notion of confidence in our legal system. One, one point you make that's interesting is on the question of, of whether Trump facing his January 6th trial uh, before the election will, quote unquote, erode that confidence. It's often said that this is a problem, right? We hear, oh, well, if the Supreme Court fast tracks uh, the trial for Trump, it's not fast tracking, but this is how it's argued. But if the Supreme Court, you know, uh, allows the trial to proceed before the election, it will look like election interference that will erode confidence. But it's never suggested that it'll erode confidence in our system if the court actively delays this trial until after the election. I want to add to your point on this. Let's remember that Trump himself wants these trials delayed. What would be more undermining to confidence in the system than the spectacle of the court essentially giving Trump the delay he wants so that voters don't learn before the election whether he committed crimes in trying to steal the last one and sabotage democracy. That's hard, That's absolutely right. That's that's what's so strange is you can understand why um, folks on Fox News, um, you know, use those talking points about uh, DOJ weaponizing the legal system. But it's incomprehensible how folks outside of Fox like buy into that story. Absolutely. And I think there's a deeper problem with the discourse that this gets at. And let me throw this at you. I think in some sense, the the quote unquote liberal media is reluctant to treat Democratic and liberal voters equivalently to the way it treats conservative voters. So this notion that confidence in the election will be rattled among conservative voters be, if if the if the trial is held before the election, if the court makes a decision that allows the trial to proceed, we 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 sort of treat it as somehow more deeply felt, more authentic a sentiment, right? More worthy of solicitude than how liberal and democratic voters would feel if the Supreme Court colludes with Trump to delay his trials until after the election. Do you think I'm right about that double standard in the discourse? Yeah, absolutely. That is, it's in, it's really like one of the core problematic asymmetries in um, the information systems we have, you know, the information environments. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the magnitude of the crisis here is kind of hard to get our heads around. Let's just go through some of the other stuff, right? In addition to the very real possibility that the court delays the January 6th trial until after the election, we're getting daily revelations about secret financial benefits enjoyed by Justice Clarence Thomas. He feels zero pressure for more transparency, as far as anyone can tell. Then you have the flags with pro-insurrectionist overtones outside Samuel Alito's houses. Now, let me ask you this, as a labor strategist, as a political strategist, is there some way that Democrats could be doing more to articulate a case that the court is becoming a fundamentally corrupted, hyper-politicized, almost captured institution, a, a sustained act of public communication that really takes on the challenge of knocking down the illusion that the high court is a neutral judicial actor. I mean, President Biden kind of went there. Senator Chris Murphy endorsed it. What could Dems be doing more of here? What they absolutely should be doing, Democrats, not because of a political play, but because it's actually their jobs, is in the Senate to be holding very aggressive investigative hear hearings about all the things you're talking about, right? That is actually why they were elected, right? And in the same way that I think the January 6th hearings were really important, not 
because it was a savvy political play, but because literally that's what their job is, right? To to make sure that every that they're held accountable, right? And they're crickets right now, right? So that's the like there is something to do, and it's not partisan. It's what they were elected to do. But I do want to say something because I think that one of the problems we've had and, and that we may run into again if people limit their perspective on whatever the ruling is to, well, was it as bad as we thought it was going to be, is if you think about we're like November 2008, right, after Obama won, right, and you, um, for whatever reasons, were in a coma and woke up right today and found out that now unlimited campaign contributions from corporations were the norm and spending it doubled. That gerrymandering had been let, let run completely wild, that the Voting Rights Act had been overturned, right? That the South had become a one-party region, passing abortion bans and all of that, that the overturning the election, and then that party gets to be in control of the House, right? And that there was no legislation passed to make this happen, right? The legislation that was passed was all the decisions that this set of justices on the court have been making, Citizens United, Shelby, Rucho, all of those things. They are legislating, and Congress, Democrats in Congress can't do anything about it. So it's lot. We've had so many last draws with the Supreme Court, right? And like, we have to be ready to understand who they are and what they're doing to us. To underscore what a crisis this could become, there's another element to this that needs to be stated clearly, and it's this: there's a lot of evidence that Jack Smith has obtained about Trump's likely criminal conduct that the public hasn't seen yet. I think it. ABC's Jonathan Carl, I believe it was, reported that Smith has amassed a, a lot of this evidence of Trump's derelict conduct on the day of January 6th while the riot raged, then it's supposed to be highly incriminating. And and here's the thing, like this is another flaw in the discourse. It's always, oh, you, we know everything about January 6th. No, we don't. He may have right. he may have been even more explicit and private in saying something like, I want the rioters to keep attacking the Capitol so that the election isn't certified. That's why I'm not interfering. That's why I'm sending a tweet at to something calling on the mob to go after Mike Pence. Smith may have nailed that down even more firmly. I think Jonathan Carl reported that Smith has talked to people around Trump about what he said that day. And so but here's the thing, Michael. If the trial is delayed, voters may not learn that information, and that would be the Supreme Court's doing. Uh, that's the problem. That's exactly the crisis, right? And if they do, and if there is a trial, then the holding of the trial will be a liability that we shouldn't have to have. A hundred percent. I want to add to your point about how skewed the media discussions of this really are, which is something you got into in your piece. The question of, of whether the Supreme Court should resolve the immunity case in time for the trial to unfold before the election is always analyzed this way, right? Oh, the court shouldn't feel obliged to do this because it would be political, right? But here's the thing. We all know that if Trump wins the election, he'll cancel prosecutions of himself, including for these January 6th related crimes. So if the court delays the January 6th trial, it's creating a pathway for Trump to do that and put himself above the law. And this is what kills me about this. There's no route the court can take here that's above the situation. It either creates a path for Trump to put himself above the law or it cuts off that pathway. The court decides that one way or the other, and that's never clearly stated in the press. I know. I, that, And that's really a big part of the problem we have is that the mainstream media should be doing a much better job of explaining to people exactly what's going on rather than like the sort of confusing picture that I think gets conveyed. And I think your piece gets into the fact that a number of these justices were uh, 
uh, voted yes on by senators who don't even make up a majority of the population. Can you talk about that in the context of this kind of broad uh, crisis we're facing? Absolutely. So there have been 116 people who have been confirmed to be on the Supreme Court. Five of them were confirmed by senators who represented less than a majority of the U.S. population, and they are five of the six Republicans serving on the court today. For almost the entire history of the Supreme Court, up until the um, the 80s, um, if the court was always approved by like 90% or better votes, and that's just not the case anymore because the Republican presidents have been nominating Federalist Society justices whose mission it is to do exactly what they've accomplished. You know, the if you think about the coalition that's the Republican Party beginning in the 60s of corporate America and the religious right, the former wanting to undo the New Deal, the latter wanting to undo the civil and human rights progress of the 60s, they realized that there was no way to get their agenda through a democratic process like Congress. And so they turned to this strategy, which people can see now how effective it is to turn the Supreme Court into a legislature um, to, once they got a majority, just pass new laws. And that's just not something the court did before this. Winning elections isn't enough for Democrats, right? No, I mean, especially now because of how far it's gotten, right? There, right now, there, are, you know, are, it, when you think about the Senate, right, there are 25 red states, all but two of the senators from there, Tester and Brown, are Republican. Democrats have all but one of the blue state seats, and they have all but one of the purple state seats. They're, you know, a hair away from not being able to get a majority again in the near future. And certainly not one that's going to be, you know, close to 60 votes. Um, and because of the skew, um, you know, right now, the 41 senators who can block, uh, you know, do a filibuster represents only 20 percent of the U.S. population. It's that bad. It really is incredible. So what's the long term prognosis here? Is there an optimistic scenario? I mean, how do we get Democrats to, to mobilize around this stuff a little bit more aggressively? I think the, the, the first step has to be for civil society to get engaged, right? I think one of the really disappointing things about this year is that, that whereas in other countries who face these kinds of threats, you see the church infrastructure, you see responsible businesses coming out, so just a couple hundred thousand people in Germany several months ago, coming out against uh, one of the right-wing parties being uh, considered yeah, a secret meeting there, right? But with all of the things you've um, had on your podcast and you've reported about what the 2025 plans are, we really need to see um, civil society step up because I think there's a lot. There are many things Democrats can do, but the problem is thinking that this is partisan rather than sort of the America we want to live in, regardless of how like, much you like the Democrats. That we all just have to get our act together um, and make this important. Most importantly, the mainstream media. Can you go big picture on us, Michael? So there are times when the Democratic Party faces uh, obstacles like this and overcomes them, right? It's often driven from below, isn't it? Um, right. A, a major activist movement, uh, you know, during the civil rights era. It almost seems to me that the problem is that there isn't mobilization among democratic constituencies. And I'm not sure what to do about that. What can you give me your reading on the state of the Democratic Party kind of at the grassroots through this prism? Well, I think you're right to bring up the civil rights movement as an example, right? And I think it's what they, one of the things that Martin Luther King with the bus boycott and then the March on Washington did that was a prerequisite for what came next was 
making it absolutely clear who those Southern governments were and what Jim Crow was and really made it impossible to avert our eyes from that, right? But remember that that was almost a century in the making. And throughout that century, you had the mainstream media really ignoring the thing, not really taking seriously uh, Jim Crow. And, and it wasn't until we all understood exactly what it was that we could mobilize against it. And that's what is a prerequisite here, too, is we have to get back to that place. And how do we get there, Michael? Um, like, I think by, by all of us just engaging in from whatever position we have, right? And uh, obviously, the most impo important thing in the short term is people talk to their friends, their networks. They make sure that everyone understands what's at stake in this election um, because we've never had an election since at least 1860 that is as close to a national referendum on what the future of the country is going to be. Well said, Michael. Thanks so much for coming on with us. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you for having me. Folks, we have some great content for you up at TNR.com as always. Tom Hartman arguing that on Juneteenth, we should examine the link between MAGA and the Old South, and Matt Ford explaining how Amy Coney Barrett is breaking with the Supreme Court's originalists. We'll see you all tomorrow. You've been listening to The Daily Blast with me, your host, Greg Sargent. The Daily Blast is a New Republic podcast and is produced by Riley Fessler and the DSR Network. 